Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to this International Manifesto webinar. My name is Ariela Ruiz Caro. I am an economist from the Humboldt University of Berlin with a master's degree in economic integration processes from the Universidad de Buenos Aires. I have worked in integration organizations in Latin America and the Caribbean, and I am Peruvian and have lived in Buenos Aires for 20 years, six of which I was economic attaché at the Peruvian embassy. I will be moderating this webinar with the topic Millet's Argentina, the supernova phase of neoliberalism. Uh, we uh, uh, programmed it with four distinguished Latin American academics, uh, but uh, two of them are not going uh, to come because they um, had some problems. One maybe is going to join us later, uh, Claudio Katz. Uh, Oscar Ugarteche is now with us. Uh, so we will be we will use the time freely uh, to make the presentations. I hope I can uh, speak a little bit more. Uh, so I I was in Buenos Aires uh, for almost three months, uh, and I came here just one month ago. So uh, let's uh, I can tell something too. So. Um, we would like to thank the International Manifesto Group for addressing this issue that has a great impact, not only in Argentina, but also in the Latin American region, as well as in the construction of new balances in international relations. So before giving the floor uh, to Oscar, I will make a brief introduction. Um, just when the strongest last bastions of neoliberalism the United States and the United Kingdom have been forced by populist revolt to question at least some elements of neoliberal wisdom. Argentina has elected the most ideologically extreme neoliberal government. Argentine President Javier Milei thinks that the state is a criminal organization that must disappear. He is surrounded by officials linked to the BlackRock Investment Fund, the largest in the world, with great interests in buying land and exploiting Argentina's wealth in a liberal framework without limits, like they are doing now in Ukraine. Milei, who took office last December 10th, has implemented an economic stabilization program with a very high social cost. In just two months, he has managed to close the fiscal gap, but at an enormous social cost, as there has been a huge loss in the purchasing power of salaries, especially for retirees, due to the elimination of subsidies and the consequent increases of up to 300% in public utility tariffs. The suspension of public works, jobs, and social benefits, benefits such as the delivery of food to canteens for the poor and medicines to hospitals, even oncological medicines, the defunding of universities, the defunding of institutions of culture, science and technology, among others, explain the fiscal balance that the president presents as his greatest success, saying that no one in humanity has been able to eliminate uh, it, the deficit gap, in such a short time. As always with these adjustment programs, consumption, investment, and tax collection have been falling dramatically. Accumulated inflation for the first four months is around 70%, the highest in the world, and poverty is around 60%. This has given rise to a growing social protest that is being violently repressed. 
the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has expressed its deep concern over the disproportionate use of public force against demonstrators and journalists in Argentina. The same has been expressed by several rapporteurs of the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. In foreign policy, Millet defends the strategic design of the unipolar world led by the United States, and he has explicitly stated his alignment with this country and with Israel. He has announced the transfer of the Argentine embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, something that no uh, uh, um, outside from the United States and Guatemala, uh, there is no country that did this. He is trying to open the doors to US to US military forces to, among other things, patrol the Parana River, the most important and navigable river in the country. The route is used by the large US food corporations, ADM, Bunge and Born, Cargill, and Dreyfus, and the Chinese commodities enterprise, which name is Kofco. In addition, it is a very busy route for the shipment of illegal narcotics, mainly cocaine to Europe, leaving from the port of Rosario, which have some, a lot of problems now, very, a very violent city. On the other hand, the Argentine government has rejected the invitation made by the BRICS to join that organization, expressing its rejection of the construction of a multipolar world. During the electoral campaign, he even said that he would not have trade or diplomatic relations with communist countries, including Brazil and China its two main trading partners. But reality made him backtrack and he said that the private sector was free to negotiate, negotiate with both. Javier Milei is intolerant and has no capacity for dialogue. He tries to govern by means of decree laws, by seeking that the Congress grants him legislative powers to carry out liberal reforms without being debated in the parliament. So far, such requests have been rejected by Congress by now, where he does not have a majority in either the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate. Senate, Senado. Having made this brief introduction, there are key, key questions that uh, we will try uh, to address, that we will address. Um, what explains Millet's election? What are his policies exactly? Where will they lead Argentine, Argentina? What does this mean for Latin America as a whole? How can it be explained that despite the economic asphyxiation of the middle and poor sectors of the country, support for Millet remains high. Some polters give him more than 50% support. Finally, is Millet's government with such a recession sustainable? A before we start, I want to tell you that the chat will remain open and I urge you all to use it politely and with respect to others. Um, so, Oscar, uh, before I give you the word, uh, the floor, uh, I want to make a presentation of you. Uh, Oscar Ugarteche is a tenured researcher at the Institute of Economic Research of the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM. He's a member of CONACYT's National System of Researchers and has been awarded several prizes and recognitions throughout his career, including the National University Prize for Economic Research in 2021. So, Oscar, uh, you have the floor, 
and thank you everybody for being thank here. You. Thank you very much, uh, Ariela and Radica, for the invitation and the International Manifesto Group. Um, I am going to give some general ideas on how economic reforms have occurred, liberal economic reforms or neoliberal economic reforms have occurred over the past, uh, it's now 50 years in Latin America. First of all, Liber economic liberalism in the new definition of liberalism, in the new neoliberal definition of liberalism, is associated to illiberal politics. There are no economic reforms done within a democratic framework, none. Uh, Chile in 73 was the first one with a coup d'etat. Argentina in 76 was the second one with another coup d'etat. Mexico in 1988 with a, a, a blockout, a blackout of the electoral system so that Salinas de Gortari would be elected and proceed with the reforms was the third one. Peru in 1992 when Fujimori closed down the Congress was the fourth one and we can go on and on. Uh, so uh, we, we know that uh, what is now called economic liberalism is not associated to political liberalism, but to political illiberalism. Secondly, all reforms we have found in our different researches are, are designed by the law firms and the economic consultancy firms associated to the largest firms interested in investing in the country. So when somebody presents a law, when a president presents a law to Congress, that law is designed by a law firm that works for the bank that wants to lead the banking sector or by the um, what by the investor the foreign investor that wants to go into mining they they put the law uh, that is what is called now self regulation which we call state capture and that that is a, a common characteristic another common characteristic and I presume it's the same case in Argentina, is that the, the grand design is done by World Bank personnel. The third, the third common uh, denominator is U.S. government support. So when, when economic reforms are introduced and the problems of lack of liberal politics appears, what we have is U.S. government support for the liberal reforms, and they put a blind eye on the on the on the political side of the thing. Uh, and it is now the political side of the thing is called populism. I don't understand what populism is anymore, but but that's what it's called. Um, so we have these three characteristics, and in the case of Argentina. There is a, a fourth element, which is common to itself. The first time Argentina went through a process of opening its economy in a drastic way was in 1956. And the person who did it was Álvaro Alzogaray, who was later member of the Montpellier Society of the neoliberal Montpellier society. Uh, that was after the coup d'etat that overthrew Perón and uh, brought in the first economic reform, liberal economic reforms. Then they went through a second period of trying to reconstitute uh, government policies and uh, the role of the state. And in 1976, they again have a coup d'etat, this time done by Videla, with Martinez de Oz, the Minister of Finance, 
who was linked strongly linked to the countryside to the to the producers of uh, of wheat of grains and he did the economic reforms at a cost of 30,000 dead and uh, I don't remember how many people went into exile um that was a second one the third one was done by Mac by um, I, in 1991 by Menem. Eh, sí, Domingo Cavallo. Domingo eh. Cavallo was, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Menem Domingo Cavallo did, did the reforms. Uh, and I found um, the reforms of Domingo Cavallo very severe, but that those reforms were better accepted than the ones of 1976 or the ones of 1956. 1991, when those reforms came along, there were protests, but they were um, they lasted a shorter period, and they were not as profound. And inflation was put under control. And once inflation was under control, um, the government of Menem had all of the support. That lasted until of course, the adjustment uh, ended in a crisis in 2001, and that was the end of the story. And now we're going to the fourth liberal reform. In every liberal reform, and this to me is surprising, there is an industrial sector that disappears. In the first one, in the one of the 1950s, the aircraft industry disappeared. Argentina produced jets in Córdoba. It had fighter jets. It had, like the U.S., it had taken some German uh, scientists to work for them, like the U.S., and it produced jets. And uh, after the reforms of 56, the jets went out. They did that, the company disappeared. Then the second time around, it was... Uh, the computers. Argentina had a made had a, um, wafers and processors in the 1970s made in Argentina. Well, that company disappeared, and Argentinian uh, computers disappeared. And as we know and remember, the Brazilian processor was not could not be imported into the U.S. So that ended with the Brazilian uh, processors as well. So every time there is an industrial branch that competes with a US branch, that industrial branch disappears in the adjustment period. This time around, it would appear it's the nuclear industry. Uh, Argentina uh, produces for hospitals um the nuclear inputs for, for 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 cancer and they sell them to hospitals all over the world uh, so probably uh, this time around that's the branch that is going to disappear mm -hmm. so there's it has to do also so these reforms also have to do with the deindustrialization of the country in 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 forward branches no um and I think finally, what happens with a support, with popular support, uh, is um, is peculiar. We, we are surprised that Millet has, we, he won with 56% of the vote. So he has the majority. And he probably now has a greater majority. Why? Why does he have a greater majority? Because and even though <laughs> the the classical neoliberals speak about this, I am not a neoliberal, but I I, I agree with them. Uh, inflation is a problem. Inflation ends up eroding your lifestyle. And what we have found, and we saw that in Peru, and I will speak about that in a second. What we have found is that when you have high inflation. Uh, the population takes side with those who think they can, can control inflation. 
So the population is against the adjustment, the idea of the adjustment, because they don't want to lose privileges. At the same time, it supports the measures that will bring down the, the, the inflation. So, the, so it's a, it's a complicated situation. But people protest because they are losing some things, and at the same time, deep down, they support it because it's controlling inflation. So, what you have at the same time is protests because the population is losing some rights, and simultaneously, the popularity of the president is going up. Now, I will uh, speak about Peru for five seconds. In Peru in 1990, Peru was undergoing uh, a hyperinflation period, much like Argentina. And uh, the solution was to bring inflation down. And there were two ways of bringing it down, the soft landing and the hard landing. The left went for the soft landing, and that's how Fujimori was elected, with the left. Once he was elected, then international capital and the larger entrepreneurs said to him, look, we need here a fast solution, so we're going to do this. And they gave him a plan that was written down. That plan had been designed by Peruvian officials that worked at the IMF and the World Bank. So we cannot say it was the World Bank and the AMF in abstract. No, it was the Peruvians that worked there who did the design. Okay. They designed it, and then he applied it. He changed political sides. So he changed his alliances. And when we all thought the popularity of the president was going down, his popularity started going up. And we did not understand because in, he, he did control inflation, but he had to introduce the reforms that international capital wanted. So he sent a package of laws, much like Millet has done for reforms. He sent that to Congress. And since Fujimori had a minority in Congress, his laws were not approved. In April the 5th, 1992, Fujimori went on television and with the support of the armed forces said, we are now closing Congress because we want to produce in this country an economic reform that will bring down inflation for good and restore growth for good. And they shut down Congress with 80% support of the population. 80. So, now we are looking at Argentina and I am thinking continuously, nobody likes Millet, no. And the left wants something else, yes. What does a population want? They want inflation under control. What else does a population want? To have uh, growth restored. Our, Peru had lost between 1987 and 1992, it had lost, I believe it was 20% of GDP. It shrunk. We also had a war at the time. So everything combined, we shrunk by 20%. Now, uh, Argentina has been stagnant for the past, I think it's 10 years. So for the population, the offer of the president of restoring growth plus the offer of the president of restoring in inflation control and the evidence, and that's why he says, I have shut down the public deficit quickly because he's telling the audience, I am putting inflation under control. And yes, there's people that protest, but no, I am going to continue doing this because we want inflation under control. And that 56% that voted for him, plus some more, will support him. So the temptation is going to be, and this is this is where, where it's going to, I think, this is where it's going to come head on. The temptation is going to be for Millet 
if he presents another package of laws that that is not approved in Congress to say, all right, if I cannot govern with you, I will shut you down. And if he does that, which would be in, in, in my line of reasoning, it is his next step. It would have U.S. support and it would also have all of the money and support of international capital that is behind him anyway, because they are the ones doing the designs of the reforms. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's explicit, it's Black Rock. I mean, we have a name, <laughs> it's not an abstract. In 1992 in Peru, it was an abstraction. Now here it is, it has a name. So now um, the, the, the interesting thing is if he does that, if he does shut down Congress, what else can he do? And here I want to recall what happened in Britain with Thatcher. What she did was basically disappear the, the unions, the trade unions. And some would argue that Thatcher's reforms were done in order to disappear the trade unions. So he's going to be tempted to shut down Congress. He's going to be tempted to destroy trade unions, demolish them. And he's probably going to be tempted to break up the political parties so that we don't have again in Argentina um, a government with a, an explicit representation of the people. We will have governments with explicit representations of particular interests. So his, his reforms are much deeper than just economic reforms, because everywhere that where we have seen these reforms, from Mexico to uh, Chile or Peru or uh, well, Guatemala, what we see is that the political system changes, the political parties change, um, the, the form of government becomes much more authoritarian and the, there is a loss in the role of trade unions and it's transformed into what is now called civil society, which is not quite the same. Um, and so I think that is where we're going with Argentina. On the, on the front of uh, foreign policy, I, I fear that what Ariela said is right. Uh, we're in a realignment of Argentina with the US in a time where the US is looking for realignments when it has taken note that China is the main trading partner of South America, the main creditor and the main investor, and that China leads in uh, in uh, renewable energy, plus it leads in uh, uh, clean transport, plus it also leads in pharmaceuticals, and apparently now it's going to lead in aircraft. That process of leadership, of technological leadership, is what the U.S. defines as a national security threat. They started with a national security threat argument uh, with Huawei cell phones and in the 5G, and now that's been massified. Now everything is a national security threat. Every item that has a technological adv advantage over the U.S. is considered a technological threat. Now that, in this context, means that the U.S. is looking not only for partners, it's looking for a company to fight off the Chinese in the, in the hemisphere. And one way to fight off the Chinese is to get them out of the economic dynamic. And that's the, and that's the thing. Getting them off the economic dynamic is, is, I think, part of the game. That's why they broke the swap with the Central Bank of China, uh, that's that's true. And so so there we are. There is a comment here, uh, if, if, uh, if the Shining Pass insurgency was also, wasn't also involved 
in the coup of 1992. I, Shining Path was more of a pretext than... Uh, Shining Path did exist. The war did exist, and the war ended in September of 1992. Those are facts. But what's also true is that what was deep down, what was uh, at the bottom of the of closing Congress, was getting the economic reforms through, fighting fighting um, Sendero. Sendero would have been defeated anyway, so that, that was that was on the military front. That they did not need to co close Congress to defeat Sendero. That was so. So that that's that. No. Uh, and and Oscar, I want uh, I can add something that the Congress was closed in April, and uh, the leader of Shining Path was captured in October. So yeah. you are right. I think the same as you. They didn't need to close the Congress to to fight against That's Shining right. Path, but right. it right. was before uh, mm -hmm. Abimael. And no, it wasn't. Does the lack of that kind of factor make it more difficult for Millet and Fujimori to close the Congress? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I think Millet can close Congress because it, it will just, he will just say, he could just say, uh, the political parties are not cooperating with our process of uh, reducing inflation. And we need to reduce inflation definitely. This is the fourth time we do this, and we need to do it definitely. And I think that's the way, he, that's the route he's going to take. And he will have all of the support of the young people who have lived always in a stagnant economy with inflation. <laughs> They're going to love a low inflation uh, atmosphere. So I fear that. Thank you. Um. If I think, well, I, I will uh, only say uh, something about what you said, Oscar. I think if Millet uh, closes the Congress, I think the reaction uh, in the population will go to the street. Really, mm -hmm. I think this is not the same context as in Peru in uh, the 90s, beginning of the 90s. Uh, I think now in Latin America, and uh, you cannot do such uh, an act closing the Congress because um, we are full of these beautiful words, democracy. And um, I think that would be, I, I think he, he could, uh, not uh, give money to the to the province. Uh, Argentina is a federal republic, so he is he's not giving money to the to the provinces. He can shut and cut the money and give anything, give nothing. So uh, I think this is the way to press the. Um, governors of the provinces to uh, vote with him in the Congress and to pass the laws. Maybe that uh, he could done this. He's uh, otherwise trying, he's doing this, but not, uh, not so hard as he could. I think he will go more in this direction than closing the Congress because I think this is um, this is uh, what could uh, the United States say? I, do you think he can? Uh, the United States government would support that Millet closes the Congress? Do you think yes. so? Oh yes. Yeah. Have, yeah. Last night in Ecuador, they have walked into the Mexican embassy and taken out. A, a, a glass who was a, a refugee at the embassy and they uh, took him out and they took the ambassador out of the embassy and the US has not said a word the OAS has not pronounced itself and it is 9.40 in the morning in Mexico so yes I think the US first of all 
the U.S. never gave a damn about democracy anyway. So we have <laughs> yeah. seen this all of the other times. No, they have interests. They don't have friends. And their interest is business. And in Mexico and in Argentina, they have had great difficulty back from 1889. I mean, this is a 100-year, 140-year uh, story you know, with Argentina. Um, Argentina and, and the U.S. have always been on the opposite sides. And this time, the U.S. is is looking for a partner. It's going to put a military base to go to the uh, Antarctica, mm -hmm. to the South Pole, uh, a U.S. military base to go to the South Pole. And it will probably get rid of the Chinese observatory. Uh, it has a... It's a Mexi It's an Argentinian observatory with Chinese uh, support. That's what it is. But they they will probably get rid of that support and su substitute it for U.S. support. No, I think Millet Millet is working with the U.S. or for the U.S. I'm not sure which is the word. Uh, and they will align themselves completely. And uh, Noboa is the same thing. Dina in Peru is the same thing. Um, so what we're seeing is a process of realignment with the U.S. now that the U.S. needs to recover its control over Latin America, which it has realized it has lost. I don't think it can recover it because the economic elements are very strong, but it's going to try to. And I think Argentina is an example of that. Oscar uh, spoke about the reforms that we, we uh, were taken by Fujimori in the 90s, uh, this neo neoliberalist uh, exper uh, experiments. Fujimori in Peru, uh, Color de Melo in Brazil, and Menem in Argentina at the same time. They were elected at the same time and they had a soft adjustment programs as a, as a speech for their campaigns. Because Vargas Llosa was the contrincant uh, to Fujimori and he has an openly liberal program, but he lost the election. That was the case in Peru. But why Fujimori, Color de Melo, and Menem uh, didn't have much resistance, uh, opposition to make these programs, these liberal programs, because we were coming from a, from the eighties, the lost decade, the hyper crisis, um, debt decade. Uh, it is we cannot compare the situation, the levels of inflation in Latin America and in Argentina with the levels of inflation that have left Alberto Fernandez. The inflation was 150% annually. In those years, we can speak about 7,000% yearly. So in that context, and in the context that the US approved this program, and that was a cons Washington consensus, the Brady plan that relieved the debt, the burden of the debt, and the program from a privatization of public enterprises, uh, those governments, didn't have the choice to make something different. So they um, uh, instrument this liberal politics. Uh, they cut, they, they fire um, employees from the public sector. Uh, th that was really, really hard. They made a hard devaluation and they stabilize quotations, the economy. But they have uh, resources uh, in that time, uh, the resources of the privatization, although they kept with m a lot of money from those privatizations, but th it, there was money and there were uh, uh, credits from the IMF, from the World Bank, the uh, 
International Development Bank, which give money to support these programs. Uh, now the situation is different. I think uh, now it is more difficult for Millet to have this support that was present in the 90s, in the be beginning of the 90s. Uh, we are really in a serious crisis. Uh, the US have a great indebtedness problem, a, a very huge fiscal deficit. And even the president of BlackRock had said, uh, had said uh, um, that uh, the United- Excuse me? Yes? I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, uh, and, and I'm sorry to come on. Uh, attend late, but what is this meeting about exactly? Uh, that I think Millet has um, cannot has more uh, problems to instrument his liberal policy. I think so. I think so. He doesn't have resources to support because he needs money. He's not. He's not uh, receiving money. The IMF is going to borrow five thousand million dollars, but to pay the the debt that he has with the IMF, but he he has not even promises uh, uh, for credits from I uh, from IDB or World Bank. He mm -hmm. only has the possibility to become resources to receive resources if he privatizes. Um, the public enterprises, which he cannot do uh, so easily because uh, he's having problems uh, in the Congress to do that. That what's, uh, that's what I um, that uh, I'm trying to say. But that that's why he's tempted to close Congress, and he doesn't need to look for money from the AMF. He has Black Rock. Black Rock is behind him. BlackRock, once once everything is in place, BlackRock will go in and buy everything they want to buy. And I, I fear the nuclear industry is the, is the, the point in case mm -hmm. and the point in question. And I also think um, BlackRock will be the way in for international capital to buy the land and uh, the mines. And the lithium mines, there are 38 projects in, in Argentina related to lithium. Three are in production, two of which are Chinese. The other 35 are basically either Argentinian uh, capital interests or European interests. There don't appear to be U.S. interests in lithium. But as we know, the U.S. government is interested in lithium. So I think... My impression is they are going to go into lithium big. They are going to put lots of money into lithium. BlackRock is going to go into lithium and finance the Argentine companies, private Argentine companies. I mean, they will put money into the mining sector related to renewable energies. As we know, the U.S. is very much behind technologically, and it does need all of these resources. And we also know that uh, General Richardson has spoken about these resources. So I think they are not looking at, at, uh, at we're not in the 90s. They are not looking at the IMF and the IDB and the World Bank, no. And this is not necessarily done, this is necessarily done by the World Bank. This is, I think, the design of Millet's program is done by, by the law firms and the economic consultancy firms of the of the large international firms in the world, the large funds. Argentina is the eighth largest country in the world. So there's lots of money to be put in there and to be made. And uh, and I think that's the conflict. And I think that's a conflict. Yes, and um, a Ministry of Economy, uh, Luis Caputo and the president of the Central Bank, both are a... Uh, both have worked uh, for BlackRock. Yeah, in this sense, you are very right. Uh, problem, yes, yes. No? It, it's, it's different. It's different, it's different, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, if the um, ah yeah you say uh, he will close the Congress if his uh, if this um, decreto de necesidad y urgencia how do you say decreto yeah. de necesidad a degree this, of national urgency yes national need that, and urgency yes that gives legislatives um, powers to the president powers yeah. to the president yeah, yeah. Uh, if this didn't uh, that, uh, doesn't pass in the Congress, then he he cannot do anything of these things, and that would be a, a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the solution you say he closed the Congress because but, think, but he has two things. He has to one close the Congress to get rid of the trade unions because trade unions in Argentina make a lot of noise and can actually stop the country. Even though they're a minority, they can stop the country. And third, he's going to try to break the political parties. Because Peronismo, which has, as we know, three at least three sides to it, that can be broken up into three. And that way, um, there will not be any consensus, political consensus in the country. And once there is no political consensus in the country, he can rule. And that's that's where he's going, I think. It is from the right what Chavez did on the left. It's the same idea. You mm -hmm. break the you 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 interfere in the process, you break it up, mm -hmm. and then Humpty Dumpty can't put itself back together again. I mean it's very difficult for the political parties to restore themselves after that. I think that's where he's going. And and uh, when you see how he is dealing with uh, with the data on inflation, I mean he's insisting that prices are are going down, even though prices this is the high price to pay for prices to go down. And he's right because yes, prices will go down because consumption will go down because people are going to starve. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. And the other thing that is also right, and it's, it's very hard, and, and, and people don't understand this, uh, most people don't understand this, if he doesn't print any pesos, people who have U.S. dollars at home will bring them out and will start buying in U.S. dollars. And they will bring the money out of the mattress. And the calculation in Argentina is there's 400 billion US dollars under the mattress. That's a lot of money. And in two months, $10 billion have come out from under the mattress. In two months. So now wait six months and we'll see where we are. And so, so some of the reasoning is correct. Now, the cost, the social cost of that reasoning is atrocious. Because you're getting rid of jobs, you're you're displacing people, you're throwing them out of their houses. People cannot pay the rent, they cannot pay the electricity bill. <laughs> I have friends that said, we have stopped using the car. <laughs> I said, you're joking. No, we stopped using the car. The price of gasoline apparently shot up and they stopped using the car. And uh, so that's, I think that's where we're going. I think that's where we're going. It's very difficult what, what they're facing. But he's, he can have success controlling inflation. And once that happens, once inflation is down, like Fujimori, once inflation was down, he gets all the reforms through. He will do anything he wants. Uh, uh, Ariela, sorry, can you see that there are three people who have raised their hands? Yes, and there's, yes, there's yes, Alicia yes, okay. Giron, who knows Argentina, Alicia. knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> so I, I, I would just yes. like, maybe you should take it to question and answer and ask Alicia and Arnold to yes. speak first. Yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, Alicia, it's so, I'm so happy that you are here with us. Um, please, you have the floor, go ahead. Yes. So thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. I just very few comments. A, a, a comment. One, first, all the Latin America process that we are seeing right now, we have to see by the uh, by that I'd say bajo la visión, by the vision of the dispute between China and USA. That's mm -hmm. true. 
The second one is that the Washington con 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 consensus has now a new face, no? And the other thing that I that uh, the USA and especially the Federal Reserve has already trying to to impose is dollarization process. This was in 2000. I went to the Federal Reserve Dallas because the problem in 2000 were dollarization. In, and in that session was Menem, the, bank, the Central Bank of Brazil and the Central Bank of Mexico. Mexico, just for a few seconds, didn't arrive in dollarization. But they want to continue with dollarization because dollarization is an imperialist money. And they don't want that Argentina or Brazil are making um, interchange by, by Chinese uh, money. And the second one is, of course, this dispute between uh, China and USA are the high investment that Chinese, uh, the principal uh, corporations, public corporations, state corporations of China are in, the, in, in South America, and especially in Argentina, in Brazil, and Amazonia, and Ecuador. So this you have is that USA is declining and they want those resources. That's, I, I will continue working. I'm very excited, but thank you very much to hear me. And congratulations. Thank you, Alicia, for your words. Uh, very interesting. So please, I don't know which one was first, Radhika or Arnold? Ask Arnold. Arnold. Arnold, please, you have the floor. Hi, Howard, hi. Thank you very much. This is a very fruitful discussion, and it proves that it um, proves what someone said. It's not the number of panelists, but the quality of interventions and the you know the ability to exchange with others and all that. Very good. I have just a, a short comment leading to a question for the panelists, specifically with regards to the election of Meli. Repercussion, geopolitical repercussions in Latin America and in the context of the upcoming Venezuelan elections, which are very important. I think we, we all agree. Now, Mele called Petro a, uh, a terrorist, uh, you know, uh, an assassin. Lula, uh, Mele said Lula was an angry communist, a totalitarian, etc. Well, since that time, of course, both countries have respect uh, have both tried and are trying to uh, you know patch this up and have good relationship with uh, with Argentinian Argentinian government at the same time these two governments that are criticized by him even though they seem to be trying to uh, patch it up they as Bloomberg said they're right he said Colombia and Brazil take unusual steps of criticizing Venezuela over elections. Bloomberg is right. It is, you know, something unexpected and from our point of view, of course, unfortunate. Now, both Colombia and Brazil, when they talk about uh, elections of Venezuela, they complain about Machado, Machado, who was, uh, you know, uh, decided upon the uh, the uh, Venezuelan court that she is not able to participate in the elections. So both uh, Colombia and Brazil just complain that she is not able to participate in elections and therefore the elections are not free. But they did not say why she was and is kept out of the elections. And it's for a specific reason. It's for sedition. What did she do? Aside from corruption, which is you know normal there, she actually went to a foreign country to an international meeting and because Venezuela was not there, she got to speak on behalf of the Pan Panamanian <laughs> delegation there. One. And what did she say? She opposed the, uh, of course, the Maduro government and called for more sanctions by the international community against, against the um, Maduro government. So that's the reason. So it's, I think it's a pretty weak on the part of Lula and, and Petro to not mention the reason so people could evaluate, well, was Venezuela right in doing so or not? So the thing is, it, it's pretty complicated. They are, you know, Malia is, 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 is criticizing Lula and Petro, and Petro and Lula are both criticizing Venezuela. Of course, Maduro, true to his way of acting and thinking, 
he does a mince word. He actually called out uh, the uh, Columbia's position that as gross interference in the internal affairs of Venezuela. So my question is, that you know, obviously the um, <sighs> Malay uh, election is a move to the right, and you know Lula and Petro, as Bloomberg said, taking this surprising decision of criticizing uh, the Venezuelan election. Is this also part of a you know right wing or uh, 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 influence that is affecting infecting I would say Latin America? So my question is to the panelists with regard to that. This very um, uh, crucial situation now in Latin America. Uh, thank you, Arnold. I think this uh, point is very interesting in the Latin American region. Elections will be held in uh, July 28. Uh, I would add uh, uh, to what you have said that uh, Maria Corina Machado not only took the representation of the government in that meeting that you mentioned in Panama, um, uh, he, he we she went uh, to Washington DC in 2005 and visited um, President Bush at the time, I guess, and asked him to invade Venezuela. So, of course, he she is um, she has an interdiction, and I think this um, propaganda, this uh, 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 enterprise for uh, uh, producing news, news uh, that are not true, and that's uh, really sad that Petro and uh, Lula. Um, are echo from this uh, kind of propaganda. And that's my point of view. So uh, please, I would like to give uh, the word to Yuri Smuter, uh, who raised the hand uh, after you, Arnold. So please go ahead, Yuri, you have the floor. Okay, perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, I, I can just, uh, well, I'll just respond very quickly to what Arnold was saying, that it's a pity that uh, that Colombia and Brazil have taken that stance, but, uh, I'll, but I'll just say that Haiti knows all too well when people throw <laughs> their, their sovereignty under the bus to carry favors with imperialists and whatnot. But my question uh, regarding Argentina is how much did corporate media in Argentina play a role in Meli's election? Did many of the newspapers and, and, and corporate outlets, did many of them endorse him or did they endorse the uh, uh, the judicial party, but be lately by saying, well, we don't really have good choices here, but we prefer the judicial party over uh, Melee. And is the panel surprised that Melee's program, which is the Menem program on steroids, uh, are, are surprised that he was able to be elected with such a huge mandate, given that his program is very much like Menem and very much like Macri's program in which he's, you know, selling the country to, you know, U.S. corporations and, and, and basically ending Argentine uh, sovereignty. Okay, thank you, Yuri. Uh, I will pick up the question and then... Um... To receive more questions, uh, Viviana, Viviana, please, you uh, have to. Yeah, thank you. And uh, it is really, um, again, congratulations on putting the panel together. And thank you for creating this opportunity for communication and exchange of ideas. I think this is really very useful. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. And I said, probably, um, I think like m many Argentinians, one is hoping Millet will not succeed. <laughs> because uh, because I think that his success would mark like a true transformation of Argentina as we know it and not in the good way. But of course, we understand a lot of people are suffering. So, um, but putting that aside, uh, putting feelings aside, what Millet is doing now, I think has been done several times before. And of course, the problem with Argentina is the big bottleneck, the external bottleneck the country constantly faces. And I think that that explains the bouts of 
hyperinflation in the country repeated, repeatedly. Millet has made emphasis on the monetary basis of inflation, that is the, the problem of printing money. So, of course, when if that's the case, of course, you reduce the fiscal deficit and supposedly that would, would be uh, one of the ingredients. The other one, of course, he's aware is a deep recession. When the country is in a recession, there is a lot less demand for dollars that also kind of reduces the pressure on external accounts and then um, some of these problems are, are addressed this way. Mille, uh, Menon did the same thing and it has been done many times before. That's what I, I is the way I see it. The question is, what is the long term solution for the reduction of Argentina of, of the of inflation in Argentina? It, and to me, that has to be fundamentally based on the transformation of the export sector. And the solution again that Millet and other neoliberals before him has found is the the the, the increasing role of the um, of the extractive sector as a component of of uh, of exports, and, and that leaves very little in the terms of jobs for the country, but also uh, uh, dollars for the country. These companies had to end up remitting all this, this is what they want, to remit their profits to. And Argentina is an extremely um, internationalized economy. So uh, what, Oscar, the question is to, to you, because I find your presentation truly very informative and insightful. What do we see in terms of long-term reforms, not only that can sustain a neoliberal, a neoliberal model of society in Latin America, not just in Argentina, but in other countries as well, because I think there is very interesting comparisons to be made with other countries in the region. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Viviana, for your interesting comments. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jan, uh, please. Um, you have the words. I I see your hand. Oh, well, let let Aka ask her question before she has to go, so if she's still here. Who? I know she put uh, Radhika put her hand down, but I think she's Radhika. still here. <clears throat> Please, Radhika, are you now, Radhika? Yes, hang on. Um, yeah, thanks, Ian. And and I just wanted to say that, uh, again, you know, I was, my question is very simple. I mean, I, I think what you have laid out is a very frightening scenario. It's a very serious scenario uh, with um, the sharpening of the conflict between the US and China. We can also expect that the US is going to support this government to the hilt. Uh, Oscar, you were mentioning this morning's event uh, in Ecuador. Um, and uh, I would say that uh, while the, the U.S. may have said nothing official, I already see that in the Financial Times there is a discourse being wound out that it's somehow acceptable what the Ecuadorians have done, violating the sovereignty of an embassy, which is almost never, I mean, it has never been done. So this is really interesting. But my question to you is, the path that Millet is following is going to be so... Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's going to exact a huge social cost. So what will be the social forces that we can expect will oppose what Millet is doing? And I know that they are not already there, but what will have to happen to put Argentina back on some kind of progressive track? That's my question, basically. Sorry, and thanks, yeah. Yeah, so, hey, thank you, Radhika. So yeah, uh, Jan, please go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, ah, you're welcome. I was glad to glad to hear that. Um, and uh, my questions about the political um, side of things, how Millie got um, into power, and I suppose it um, overlaps with Radica's actually, which I saw in the chat and thought it would be good to, to get in person, because um, it seemed to be quite a political car crash at the last election, uh, specifically with the lawfare. It was extremely similar to what had happened in Brazil a couple of election cycles ago when Lula got banned. This time, Cristina Fernandes de Kirchner was banned, who was seen as the main left candidate, um, who'd actually put together the, the previous government as a very broad front, where she deliberately took the back seat as vice president, having been seen as the main candidate that time in a very clever move to get the Macri neoliberal government out. But then because it was so broad, it got deadlocked. So when the judges came for her um, and she wasn't able to stand on a clearer line, 
it looked like the alternative to Millie was continuing um, the the deadlock that had been been going on with the candidate uh, who was the actual economy minister and an extreme centrist, the guy Massa, who'd actually gone to Davos with Macri in 2015, having effectively endorsed Macri in the second round after running as a, a minor right-wing candidate himself. Um, so he had all the political problems, perhaps, of a late-stage Alberto Fernandez government, but none of Alberto's um, qualities as a candidate that proved so good in 2019, um, as far as I could see from Scotland, <laughs> anyway. Um, and it, it was shocking to me, especially when there was an attempted assassination of Christina, that that barely moved the dial. But of course, that came out of the reactionary atmosphere that the lawfare was already building up, linking the left um, to corruption as if there wasn't corruption on the right. It's just that it's not investigated in the fine way, perhaps, how the judges um, or the Macri cases that were actually a lot more weren't reported as much and so on. So this whole kind of media, traditional uh, witch hunt, very reminiscent of what happened to Lula. Uh, I know the discussion of inflation that we've had today, but how much was that the reason that someone as explicitly neoliberal as Millie, as opposed to uh, Fujimori, who changed his mind, Menem, I think, said, well, I've campaigned for the opposite of what I was going to do, because if I told them the truth, they'd never elect me, <laughs> that someone like Millie could get elected because of that atmosphere, and how much is it likely to change, like Bolsonaro's Brazil was turned around and Lula came back? Is that happy ending likely to be repeated, and what can we do to to try and make that more likely. Oh, thank you so uh, much, yeah, and that's an interesting question. I I wonder me the same as you. So please, Jeffrey, uh, go ahead. Please, you have the floor. I see your. Okay, I know I missed I missed the first half, first hour. I mean, even though I was here, I just, I didn't have my headset on when I was listening. I was just trying 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 to wake up or stuff. Okay, I per I don't understand the difference between liberalism, neoliberalism, and progressive progressive progressism. Uh, it's a pronounced progressism. Progress that that's my first question. First off, I got I got I got kind of got a lot. That's your first question. Are you going yeah. to make the, the next one now? Well, uh, well, not not yet, not yet. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, I want I, to see. I, yes. Yes. Please. Actually, and what's what's the problem here with the with the go with what's going on in Argentina, the the moral and all that, and you know, so I can maybe come up with a solution. Maybe again, depending on your answer to the second question, will depend on if I, if there's a third question or not. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So um, I think I will let the uh, question that is uh, on the chat uh, after. And Oscar, uh, please, uh, could you? <laughs> <laughs> right. So what are the long-term reforms for inflation to go down? Uh, all right. First of all, uh, if we believe that we're going to have an employment policy and that we believe that we need employment uh, because also the economy is for everybody, not for the few, then we need to have productive policies. And that, having productive policies, will always bring some inflation. But it's different to have some inflation than to have 150% inflation or 7,000% inflation. So the limits of hyperinflation in Argentina appear to be produced by a combination of factors. I mean, the, the four times, the five times, that the balance of payments of Argentina has been strangled, strangled to death almost, has been accompanied by a flight of capital, a very large flight of capital from Argentina abroad. 
I remember very much 2001 when people were taking the money out of the banks, changing them for dollars, driving across the bridge and depositing those dollars in, in the banks in Colonia, Uruguay. Uh, that was the small scale of what on a larger scale was done by the larger, by the richer people who put their money abroad in, in, in Europe and in, uh, in tax havens. Uh, so there's a problem of lack of faith, if you want. There is, there is no belief that the peso can be stabilized. There's, uh, and because of that, the Argentines don't save in domestic currency in spite of having had high interest rates. And in spite of that, they did not save in, in pesos. So in every other country, when high interest rates were put in the, in the banking sector, uh, there was a process of de-dollarization. Bolivia is a case in point, Peru, Brazil. Uh, but in Ecuador and in Argentina, high interest rates do not lead to keeping local currency. So our, this, the Equatorian solution was turned into dollars, and now it's a dollarized economy. In, in Argentina, if they do dollarize, they will lose their control of money supply and they will not be able to have monetary policy. And if you don't have monetary policy, you cannot have economic policy. And the difference between Ecuador and Argentina is that Argentina has an industrial base, a large industrial base, so large that it has a nuclear industry, for example, uh, it's large. Now, so how do we recover faith? That's one. That's one question, and uh, it it seems that uh, what we're looking at, and, and it's not an Argentine problem, is we're we're in a polarized context where where two sides of society cannot agree on where they want the country to go, because this is this is not a class thing, strictly speaking. This is not a, it's a generation thing. The young people want something and older people want something else. And, and it's clear. And the people who voted for Millet are the younger ones. And the ones that want the status quo are the older ones. And so how, how do we recover the young people's faith in the country? Now that's, that's I think that's, that's an interesting question. The other thing, yeah, from an economic policy side, is that, yes, we need we need production uh, policies. We need uh, productive policies. And we, yes, we do need a state. And yes, we do need taxes. And, and Argentina has a level of taxation as equal to the European ones, 34% of GDP. But we also need to know that the money is used wisely. And that is apparently not evident. Apparently, the, uh, the, the these high tax revenues have not been used very wisely. Otherwise, we wouldn't have be having this crisis, repeated crisis. No? So, so we need more productive policies. We need to recover the faith in the future. And that productive policies can do that because with productive policies, we have employment uh, as a result. And that is good for younger people who are looking at the future. And they want to stay in their country. They don't want to migrate. What we're watching all over Latin America is a migration of the young from Mexico down to Chile. Young people are moving out. They're going to Europe. They're going to the States. They're going to China. They're going to Korea, Japan. But they're leaving Latin America because they think Latin America has no future. And it's right. This it looks like it has no future. And with 2% growth rates, we're not going anywhere. And that's because we have these open, open, open growth policies that are not taking us anywhere. So that's that. Second. Hold uh, up. Before you, before you go on to second, I think I have a solution to this. Mm -hmm. I, I had an idea for, you know how 
you know how Europe has the European Union and Africa has the African Union? Mm. I thought I came up with an idea a while ago. It's called the American Union, a co country, you know, a gr you know, comprised of all the all the countries uh, together from the American region, both North, Central, and South America together. Jeffrey, you know? if you put the U.S. into a union, it's no longer a union of the equals. It's a union of the subordinates. That's a bad thing, right? That's why we cannot do that. And that when we have tried since 1824, we have done different efforts at integrating and uh, the domestic quarrels are very large and U.S. interference is also present. So we haven't gotten anywhere. So, so much that, integration. So the idea is good, but the, right now, but doing it right now is a bad, is not, not good, correct? I think it's not possible. If it has not been done over 200 years, I think it cannot be done. Well, our yeah. last effort was UNASUR, which we tried to do in, 19, in 2013, 2012. And it worked for a little bit. And then the presidents died. And that was the end of it. Well, I, well, I know. I'll uh, sorry, I'll... can I can I just say we, we I don't think we should have a back and forth like this. Are you like you you, you should take questions in turn, and okay. then there are answers, and that should be questions. Okay. okay. My, my apologies. Okay. okay. Uh, Oscar, please continue. What is a social? What social reorganization do we need to face this? We have we have now. I think we have several problems. One is. Given the problem of the trade unions and given the problems of age in the political parties, we know now what we're, what we're looking at is political parties that are stuffed with older people. Young people are not entering political parties, but young people are into um, social movement, ecological movement, uh, gender movements, gay rights movements. So it is possible that what we're going to see is a restructuring of politics around single issue movements, but that will ally themselves to face the global problem. What we don't have, and that is a major problem, is we don't have yet uh, an alternative, a concrete alternative. There is no concrete alternative to what the uh, neoliberal right has done. We used to have, and the answer to every problem when I was 25, was revolution. Okay, so we had we had Cuba, we had Nicaragua. Okay, and there we are. And there we are. Can we show them as examples of success? Hardly. And does everybody want to go and live in a country where there's lack of food and lack of freedoms and so on? No. So, so yes, we support things. But then it turns out that once you, once it's real, and after it goes down ten or twenty years, it doesn't quite work the way we thought. We need we need to rethink where we want to go in the long run on the left, because where we have what we have reached is not satisfactory. I don't think. Now, when we look at Asia, that's the other side. What we see is that they are growing lots. They are growing by lots, by huge steps, with lots of uh, employment, with a narrowness in the democratic field. Is that what we want? And that, that is a, a, that's another major question, because for the Africans who are now... <laughs> They are, they are really leading in this in this uh, in this movement to the left. Uh, they are, they are inventing the future. The Africans are right now inventing the future, no? Trying to see the way forward, looking at Asia, 
looking at us and sort of trying to see how they can have industrialization policies and how they can have um, a nationalist policy for the raw materials and sort of improve their positions. Um, they're doing that slowly, but they're doing it. So maybe we have to look at what they're doing and we have to all work together to get a new view because we there is no new view. If you look at it seriously, I mean, we used to, we used to in the 70s, it used to be so clear. You know? It was a, a problem of power. You change the power structure, everything is solved. And so we changed the power structure in a few countries and no, not everything was solved because this, the economic structural problems were there. Cuba's best example. Uh, Cuba, even without the uh, restrictions imposed by the US sanctions, Cuba has lots of problems. Cuba has lots of problems. They could not put together any kind of an industrial base, which is wrong. That was wrong. And that was a decision taken in 19, whatever, 62. And, uh, and if they had gone the industrial route, which would have been, I think, better, uh, they would have faced the, the external sector bottleneck because of the strangulation by the U.S. But anyway, so there we are. So thank you, Oscar. Uh, I want to add uh, some uh, point. Uh, that is that uh, we have already a, a summit of the Americas. It is not that we don't have a union with uh, the U.S., Latin America, the Caribbean, and the U.S. It is called the Summit of the Americas, and it was uh, created in 1994. Uh, all presidents uh, have a meeting, a, a summit, um, each three years, but it has lost importance. It doesn't have any meaning now. At the beginning, they were the promoters of the Washington Consensus and um, many initiatives, energy initiatives, uh, but now they don't have any, any importance because the only thing that the US president uh, presents on that summit is to, uh, to uh, he asked the countries not to receive uh, China's uh, investments in the technological sector, especially in 5G uh, technology and those kind of uh, uh, questions. So uh, Latin American governments, uh, they hear, but of course they do most of, or, or many governments uh, don't care about that. Chile is not a, a left, not now, but before Sebastián Piñera, uh, he he always uh, he used Huawei five G technology and everything. So that I I wanted to um, to add this, and also I think that uh, Milley uh, will not last <laughs> because uh, although now. He has fifty percent of respaldo. Um, uh, 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 he had he had lost twelve points because when he started the government, he had sixty two percent. So he is losing, although in, although it. Uh, it, he still has an important uh, yeah. back. Uh, and in which sector he has lost more uh, respaldo uh, back um, on the, in the young people? Because young people, ah. yes, in the uh, the late the latest uh, post uh, polls. Uh, say this, uh, um, the, he is losing, especially in the young people. Although it has, it he still has a big uh, respaldo. Support. Uh, how is the word? Support. 
support, yes, um, the, the big support. And then Argentina has elections each four years. So I think um, the program is so hard. It has so much social consequences uh, that anyway, although parties are divided, uh, like Oscar has said, uh, I think uh, I'm almost sure that the next um, government uh, will not be Millet, not only because the politics, it, it is also because his character, as I said at the beginning, he's a very hysterical, um, and this kind of, of uh, personalities, I think they don't last. Maybe um, the vice president, Victoria Villarroel, who is more intelligent, uh, he, he can, um, he can has better, he, he could have better chances to govern because the, in this week, last week, there was a, a political, they were trying to build a political judge for Millet for being not crazy, but a not psychological, um, that he doesn't have that uh, psycho psychological characteristics to be a president. So these kind of things are going to be in progress. And uh, in two years, uh, there are mi uh, middle elections in the parliament. And I think uh, they, uh, he will lose. I, I think the trend is that he will be losing support of the population. Um, yeah, that, that's my, my view. Um so I if uh, there's no more questions, there are some on the chat. There there is one more answer I have to give. It says it's um it's utopian to think that private capital can go over the IMF and the World Bank. And the answer to that is it will not go over, it will go with what what is going to happen, I think, is that uh the World Bank is going to do the reforms it needs to do with the, with the IMF, and the money is not going to be put by the IMF. It's going to be put by BlackRock. So they're going to invest, and that way they're going to push forward the economy. That's my hunch. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise it doesn't make any sense. The, it is their candidate. They have put him there. And the reason why they have put in there because they want to put money into Argentina. So they're going to put the money into Argentina in hand in hand with the IMF and the World Bank. Mm. Oh, okay, Oscar, thank you so much. Oh, so I, I have two questions here before I go to the ones that are on the chat. Uh, please, yeah, Jan, go ahead, please. I saw when Jeffrey was being rebuked and asked to put his hand up again for a second round, I thought maybe that could apply to some of the others of us too. I see Radek has got her hand back up too. Now, so thank you. Um, and I'd like to add to the note of hope that you were starting to build at the end, because it must seem awfully bleak over there now with uh, Malay um, elected. But... As I said at the end of my last um, contribution, the situation in Brazil was very similar, or even Argentina with Macri a few a few years ago. And I think you're right about his personality, uh, Malays, um, more like Bolsonaro than like Macri, who is seen as a more Macri presentable face of the realignment with the United States than Bolsonaro ever was. And I don't know if it was just a fluke that Bolsonaro was out after one term and Lula came back, if that was just because of COVID, where he was particularly awful, or because he was aligned to Trump, so Biden didn't feel um, particularly inclined to go out of his way to, to save him, um, and that if Trump was back by 2027 or, or sooner, when Malay was in trouble, that um, it would definitely go a different way or indeed if the US president would have the decisive impact. 
Um, I do think the Christina case has always been ignored a lot more in the West and in the wider world than the Lula case, even though they're incredibly similar and have now led to incredibly similar presidential election results. Um, and I wonder if that's something that we should try uh, to change. I've seen in the chat some discussion that she now can't go to jail because of her age, though she's obviously a lot younger than um, some of the uh, Junta generals were when they were being uh, sent to jail um, under her and her husband's presidency 10 or 20 years ago. So um, I don't know if there's still any danger of that. But um, if there's no danger of her going to prison, in a way that's good. But in another way, that surely shouldn't preclude her from seeing this process through to the end and being found not guilty of these false charges, which have already exacted one uh, penalty of um, uh, banned from standing in elections, which was uh, the decisive one um, in this um, uh, this time round. Um, I also wonder if there'll be any chance of a realignment politically. There's a, a very large Trotskyist party I think sadly been sectarian towards Kirchnerism and in the past, um, but there's a factor there. Um, I wonder how much the broad front tactic, though it worked very well against um, Macri in 2019, um, didn't seem to hold up when um, it had already been in power um, that uh, that term when Milley was, was standing and if there'd been a more left candidate who rejected rather than being associated with the side of the government that said we have to go back to the IMF and so on, if they'd have been able to do better even last time. And if that surely shouldn't be the way forward um, next time. And finally, on Villa Royale, it um, reminds me of that um, picture of Nixon with Spiro Agnew behind him in the 70s. Well, they can't impeach me with him standing behind me. That, that Millie's a madman, but she's even worse, maybe because, as you said, Ariella, she's more intelligent, more normal in some ways, but also much more deeply involved with the dictatorship side of the right as opposed to the economic side of the right. Um, and, yeah, if it was just to say Millie out and she's the next one, that would be insufficient. It really has to be kiss of iron todos, I suppose. Okay, thank you, Jan. Um, I think Chris was before you, Radhika. You, yeah. Sure. Okay. Chris, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. you. Um, I, I, I have a question with respect to where do these <clears throat> these policies? What are what's the likely um, long or medium term medium to long term outcomes of these policies? Because um, I know Oscar said that Africa seems to be leading, but I think that Africa is two is a two part thing. Uh, yes, the francophone countries are redefining French uh, imperialism in the country, but we have countries like Nigeria, where I'm from. Uh, you've got Kenya, Egypt, that have been instituting a raft of neoliberal policies: the um, liberalisation of the exchange rate removal of fuel subsidies, this is the case of Nigeria, and uh, recently, just three days ago, uh, removal of uh, electricity tariffs. We've had um, record inflation, and uh, also over the course of 10 months, exit of manufacturing businesses from, from the country. So my, my question is, just maybe from my perspective, uh, what is the experience of Latin America with this neoliberal policies, such as the one that is coming through in Argentina, and, and what is the potential outcome, um, and whether that would be, that, that would um, re re relate to countries in Africa, which have a lower industrial base than mm -hmm. uh, Latin America. Okay, thank you, Chris. Radhika, please. Yeah, so just a very quick question uh, for anybody, uh, Ariela, Oscar, and anyone else who wants to comment on this. I, I think, you know, when Malay was fighting the election and putting forward his really, really, I mean, very extreme policies, he was very much regarded as a madcap, you know, crackpot 
uh, man and and definitely an outsider to the system. So how do does that aspect play into the situation now? Your your thoughts will be very much appreciated. Mm -hmm. So, Oscar, please. Okay. Now, what are the effects of the reforms in Latin America? I will say quickly. Inflation went down. Migration went up. Uh, international capital bought up the financial sector. And we reprimarized, we deindustrialized and uh, became strong uh, exporters of raw materials again, and uh, with no employment, little employment, which is a reason for more migration. So now we consider uh, workers' remittances a positive thing because they are the positive result of the growth. In terms of economic growth, we have an average 2% growth over the past 30 years, which is insufficient, grossly insufficient. So it's, it's, a, it's not a success. But the success is that income is now more concentrated than it was 30 years ago. And the 1% and the 10% uh, on the top uh, of, the economy, of the society are much richer than they were. And in some countries, there are now programs like in Mexico for universal basic income, uh, and you have so you have transfers to the poorer sectors, and uh, that's it. That doesn't solve the employment problem. It doesn't solve the production problem. It solves eating. Uh, that's that's what it looks like. It's it's not not good. Uh, what what I refer to in Africa were the countries that were nationalizing the mines and nationalizing the raw materials in order to have better fiscal revenues in order to have development. That's what I was meaning. I was not meaning the countries that are doing... Ghana is a case of failure of neoliberal policies in Africa. I think that's... Uh, okay. Okay. Radhika's question? Uh, remind me. Radhika said... Radhika? Can Sorry. can you repeat, please? I, I didn't... Yes, I, I, can you please? Please, Radhika, yeah, sure. In three words. I was, I was, I was merely referring to the fact that when he was fighting the election and the policies he was putting forward, which were very extreme and sort of, you know, crackpot type policies, uh, 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 you know, dollarizing the economy, etc. This all this made him seem like an outsider. Yeah. Uh, and 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 not really like more like a Trump figure rather than somebody like a Biden figure who is in with all the big global corporate capitalists and so on. So if you can maybe comment on that a little bit. Yes, I think yeah. Millet appealed to the radical speech. The the uh, the status quo in Argentina is is very heavy. It's very big. Uh, Societies. Tacuajada, it's, uh, <laughs> it's gelled, gelled is the word. Uh, it's a gelled society. I mean, it's a society where Peronismo has done lots of things and there are institutions, social institutions, welfare, and so on. And here comes a man saying crazy things and saying, we're going to get rid of inflation and recover growth and be an economic power again. And there he connects with, uh, with Trump. I think they all belong to the same Atlas network. That's my impression. They all belong to the neoliberal network with Bolsonaro, Netanyahu, Modi. They all belong to the same club of, uh, of ideology. Uh, Bannon, I think, is the articulator of that, of that club, I think. And um, that, this, um, this, this radical speech goes against the status quo and becomes appealing to younger people who voted for him. Now, if those younger people are being disaffected because of the consequences of the policies, then maybe things are not going well for him. But if inflation does go down, and I think it will, because people are going to starve, and once you could take consumption down to the point of observation, of course prices go down. You have starved a part of the population, but prices will go down. And that, I fear, is the problem. I think if inflation does go down, 
he will continue having support from the younger people. And the young people are not looking at the interests of large capital. I mean, BlackRock, Vanguard Capital, those things, for the younger people, those are not issues. And, uh, and for the younger people, I, I am not sure what their position is on the U.S. Because it is, as Alicia said, all of this is in 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 the in the uh, in the discussion between the spheres of influence and the great power competition, and Argentina is in the middle of the security sphere of influence of the U.S. and the economic sphere of influence of China. It's right in the middle, and so that's where it's that's where the that's where the clash happens. No. Mm. Oh, thank you, Oscar. Uh, I would like to add uh, that Millet is. A is uh, presented as an outsider, but he's a construction um, of the corporations, even uh, from the local corporations of Argentina. But of course, I agree with you that he's part of this Atlas club, uh, Trump, uh, Netanyahu and others. Um, I think uh, the Argentine people is very, um, uh, very um, political educated. Uh, we must not forget that uh, Massa, Sergio Massa, which was the candidate from Cristina, from the, from the Peronismo, uh, he, uh, he had, he won the first round of the election with 47 percent he four points more and he would have won win the, the the elections so it is not that the peronist movement was destroyed that's not like that that we forget this data that is very important uh, so then in the second round, yes, of course, he joined, we know the story with Macri, and then they won. They had a, a, a very, uh, they, they lost, <laughs> and the difference was uh, big. But in the first uh, round of the elections, uh, you can see that the, the el peronismo no está muerto, say we <laughs> not that, that is. <laughs> and I'm sure um, this week there were many uh, strikes on the street, the teachers, the uh, employees for, from the state that were fired, and they were big manifestations and very high um, repressed, highly repressed. So um, this is not going to end the Central General de Trabajadores, uh, uh, this is the syndicates. They will uh, make a manif manifestation next week and then uh, the first um, on May, my first. So um, this, uh, they, they are reactions to this, uh, to, to Millet's politic. Because as Oscar say, the inflation will go down, of course, but is this sustainable? I think this model is not sustainable because it means people will die because people is really suffering. Argentina had a welfare state, so you cannot cut it from the day to from one day to another like he has done. It will, it will. Um, uh, it, it will break up. Uh, I, I, it is not, I think, as conclusion, as my conclusion, uh, after hearing all of you, that this is not sustainable. Sooner or later, this government uh, will finish. It doesn't have um, strong uh, support, and uh, I, I trust on that. Uh, so, I, um, I don't see any hand raised, so, but there are many chats on the, many questions on the chat. 
Radhika, what <laughs> should you suggest me? Because there are six, it's six minutes <laughs> before this finishes. Ariella, uh, Radhika had to leave. And ah, so yes. Uh, yes. You, you are in command. Uh, I got a, I got a big question. Is this meeting going to be over before before 10, 10 a.m. Pacific time? Because I, I got another meeting to attend to at that time. Uh, Jeffrey, we're on the point of leaving. You can you can go right now, and and oh. you won't miss anything. Oh, okay. 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 So um, there there there's a questions, and the pattern is by now clear. <laughs> left Keynesian policies in times of high commodity prices on world markets at the way from Chavez, Lula, and trying to replicate the capitalist welfare state is not an electoral alternative to conservatives and reactionaries when the world capitalist economy goes down under their tenures. It is true that to implement even 20% of his program that will require narrowing political and democratic space. That's a, com a commentary. Um, uh, wait, I want to not commentaries, but ask questions. Uh, um, Cuba has been, uh, a, 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 I think this is a reply to what Oscar said about Cuba and Nicaragua, that they have no uh, 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 good results. So, well, Cuba has been crippled by sanctions as has Nicaragua and like Venezuela each time they go after insincere actors back to the West. But back to the West people, and sadly, many leftists cry tyranny. Uh, maybe that you can add something to that. Yeah, uh, but, but no, I, but the point with Cuba is not, from my point of view, it's yes, not, of it's not the, the, if it's a tyranny or not a tyranny, the point with Cuba is it was meant, Che Guevara wanted to industrialize Cuba. Fidel didn't. In 1962, Fidel reached an agreement with the Soviet Union for an exchange of sugar for oil. And Cuba lived from the exchange from oil for sugar until 1990. In 1990, the Soviet Union disappeared, and that was the end of the exchange. And Cuba found itself without a productive base. That's the point. And the fact that uh, Cuba renounced having an industrial base, I think was a mistake. I think that was a mistake. I will write it. I think that was a major mistake. And now, because on top of that, you have the sanctions. The sanctions come on top. But the real problem is not the sanctions. The real problem is there is no productive base. The real, the real problem was uh, Cuba never had employment. The, the employment problem in Cuba is a very old problem. And migration from Cuba started because of always. Migration is a result. They say it's politics. It's not politics. It's employment. And it's very old. It goes back to the 80s of people not being able to have a proper job, not being able to have a... a, a not, be, not even having proper growth, no? And so, yes, you can do things with subsidies. You, Yes, you can. But no, you cannot solve the problem of employment. I mean, if you don't have a productive base, people who do not get organized. And if you do not get organized, then all, you have all the consequences we know. So that's, I think that's the problem with Cuba. Now, the problem with Nicaragua, I think <laughs> they are repeating the Somoza story now on the left, so family politics. And uh, they're awful. Oh God, I I worked with them for years. I worked with the central bank for many many years, and uh, and I think they have a a political problem. Yes, because you you don't want to have a repeat of the Somoza family in the Ortega family. I mean, but uh, some people say that you ca you carry your history in your genes, 
So maybe that's true. Or maybe. Hmm. Okay, thank you, Oscar. And then is the last uh, question because it's uh, presented as a question. Um, should we not try and make Christina Case as well known internationally as Lula's was? And this is the intent of assassination to Christina Kirchner. Do you want Oscar or somebody? I I, th I think two things uh, in terms of our, in terms of Argentina, but the problem is that the Argentines are not going to like it. One is we should have solidarity with Argentina. The people of Argentina who are suffering should receive solidarity from the world. Now the problem from the Argentinian point of view, it is like giving solidarity to France. I mean, why should people? give us solidarity if we are we are the white and the rich of South America. <laughs> why why do you want to give us all your solidarity? Well because you because we know where you're heading. <laughs> That's the reason why. <laughs> I I think uh, they are uh, referring to Christina's assassination Case. intent. Uh, yes. yes. And yes. I think that should be made public, yes, it should be more public ah. indeed. Yes. 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 yes I, I also think yes. the same to you. But I think it has not been made more public because of this, because we are the white and the rich. So we you know, we yeah. don't discuss this publicly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we are on time. Uh, we are very glad to have had all of you this morning. And um, let's see in another seminar uh, radica wanted to tell something but maybe you um paul or you can say something uh, about the next seminar the next webinar i'm afraid i i don't have that information uh, handy um, i i notice arnold has his hand up maybe he knows the answer arnold? to your question ah yes arnold no you are unmute are you can mute? I, yes. No, I don't have the answer. I just, ah. it's okay. Okay, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much to all. And then we see us in the next webinar. Thank okay. you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Nice to be you. Bye -bye. Thank, thank you. you. Congratulations, thank you. Bye. Oscar and Ariela. Bye. 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 Gracias, Alicia. <laughs> Till we meet again. Bye. Keep in touch. Bye. 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 I'm Michael Hudson. I'm appearing here for the International Manifesto Group. If you like this video and want to like it, please subscribe. For more information, go to the address on the screen.